We're continuing our series here talking about, uh, this week, talking about loss. Asking the question, what does the Bible say about loss? And it says a lot, uh, because loss is something that is part of every one of our lives. Whether it's the loss of a friend, the loss of a job, uh, the loss of a loved one who passes away, uh, the loss of, of someone who moves far away. We go through multiple losses, uh, really every year. Uh, but, but we go through some significant losses in our lives. And as followers of Jesus, that's normal. That's to be expected. We don't get a free pass here on loss. Uh, we have loss just like everybody else has loss. The difference is, though, we have a God who loves us, who cares about us, who never lets go of us, no matter what. We're going to look at, this, at a story this morning uh, of perhaps the greatest friendship in all of life. And it was a friendship in which some loss would be experienced in a couple different ways. Uh, uh, king David, you remember him. This story happens before he became king. In fact, he was a shepherd boy at this time. He had just fought Goliath. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we'll start a new message series talking about that story. It would be a lot of fun. And David had just defeated Goliath. And that gives you a lot of popularity when you defeat the country's number one enemy. So David gets a promotion. He gets uh, brought into the military. In time, David will get promoted and be over a pretty good number of men. And so David becomes great friends with a guy named Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of Saul, and Saul was the king of Israel. So Saul would be the first king. David would later be the second king. So it's an interesting friendship because uh, they, they love each other very much. They're like ancient BFFs, right? I mean, these guys, they, I don't know exactly what they did, but maybe they got matching tattoos, maybe they uploaded awkward numbers of selfies to Facebook of themselves together. I don't know what they did, but they were good buddies, and they liked spending time together, and they loved each other very much. Well, the problem came in that, that there came, became some tension between Saul, the king, and David, who was an increasingly great warrior. See, uh, they were fighting the Philistines, their enemies, and David was becoming more and more successful, and the Israelites had won a significant battle, and they were coming back uh, home, and they were having kind of a big parade, a big celebration. Now, you've seen those pictures of the United States after World War II, when our, our soldiers came back from war, and we had these great parties and parades and all this, so they're having their version of that. And while they're celebrating, uh, some of the ladies from town, they've written a song, and they've written a song of celebration. They begin to sing, and they sing, Saul has slain his thousands. And Saul is proud, and yes, I've slain my thousands. I'm your king, you should be proud of me. And then they continue, and they say, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And then Saul's face drops, right? Because if you're the king... You don't want to take second chair to anybody. You don't want all the ladies singing about David and, and, and not you. And so Saul is angry. He's hurt. And, and he uh, is offended by this. Tragically, this is an offense he will carry with him the rest of his time as king of Israel. He won't get over this one. He will be jealous of David from this point forward. In fact, he would soon send David on some extremely dangerous missions hoping that David would be killed. But David was successful. He was God's anointed. He'd been chosen by God, and he was successful on the battlefield. So Saul himself one time, even attempts, or multiple times, even attempts to kill David's life, to kill David. And, and so this naturally creates a big tension between Jonathan, the son of Saul, and, and, and Saul, because Jonathan is angry with his dad. He's angry, he's angry. Yes, David is successful, but that's why you put him in the military. You shouldn't be mad at him because he's successful. But Saul is infuriated with his son Jonathan for standing up for David. Uh, 1 Samuel 20, verse 30 says this. Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman. You can do the math, is what he's saying, right? If you don't know, read the New Living Translation. It looks a little more clear than the New Living don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother who bore you? These are strong words. As long as the son of Jesse, that's David, lives on this earth, 
neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now sin and bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. His own son. That's how angry he is. And then one of the most obvious verses in the Bible. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. <laughs> Way to go, Jonathan. Start from there. So, so Jonathan realizes we got a big problem here. This isn't just dad being mad about some song. He's not going to get over this. He truly wants to kill David. And so Jonathan and David, they, they love each other very much, but Jonathan knows that, they, that David cannot remain there around the palace. Saul is going to kill him. It's going to happen one time or another, so he's got to get out of there. And so in one of the most saddening moments of the Bible, uh, Jonathan and David, they meet in this field by themselves. And they, they say this tearful goodbye uh, because they know that they can't be around one another anymore because David has to flee. You know, sometimes loss can begin before a person even dies. And uh, Jonathan and David experienced that. They experienced this loss. The best of our knowledge, they wouldn't see each other again. It's not like they could be texting each other and keeping up with each other over long distance. Not an option yet. And so eventually, eventually David's role would change. He would uh, ultimately become king of Israel. Uh, but, but Saul and Jonathan would one day be on the battlefield together. And battle did not go well. And in one day, Saul and Jonathan both died in the battlefield. Now David, how's he going to respond? You'd think he could be happy, right? His arch enemy Saul is dead. But that's not his response. His love for David is so, or excuse me, for David's love for Jonathan is so strong uh, that he writes this, this song. It says this, 2 Samuel 1, 23. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely. In life and death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. O oh, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson and luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lay slain in high places. I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love was great, it was wonderful, passing the love of women. Oh, how the mighty have fallen, the weapons of war have perished. Saying, we should be sad. This is a tragic loss for us as a nation. Jonathan and Saul have died, and, and we, we should grieve. We should mourn. David is no loss. He killed the wife, remember? I mean, one of the greatest warriors in the Bible right here. In fact, in an earlier story, Saul sent him out to kill 100 Philistines by himself. He kills 200, right? So this is, this is no, like, weakling. And what does he do? He grieves. He mourns. He's sad. He lets everybody know about it. Kind of different than the way that we be lost sometimes. Oh, tough people don't need to cry. That's weak. It's not true. Jesus wept better than him. We need to weep. We need to grieve. It's part of being human because loss is part of being human, and God has created us to have these emotions. They're, they're gifts from God. They're part of who we are. They're not something to be suppressed and ignored. No, they're, they're, so, they're things that help us through these tough times. We need to go through grief when, when we experience loss. Also, we, we do things to honor those who have gone on before us. So David did this. It's an interesting situation because when it was very rare, but when, when one king would die and Typically, his son would become king. That was normal. So it was rare to have someone from another family become king. But if you had this situation, there was kind of a standard protocol that happened in the ancient world. The, the new king would find uh, the people, or at least the males, of the other household and would round them all up and would kill them. Not real hospitable, right? We thought the uh, Democrats and Republicans hate each other, right? But, but the reason they do this is because, the, because let's say you're the new king, and you've been king for a few months, 
And so things start going kind of bad. It would, if there's other errors from the old family, the old kingly family around, and you say, well, well wait a minute here. This, this new guy, we don't like him. He, he makes bad choices. He's messing up our country. Why don't we get rid of him and bring in one of the cousins? You know, we should bring one of them in. And so consequently, they would have them all killed so that there was no other potential errors, errors, so that there wouldn't be any chance of bringing them in to become king. Well, David does exactly the opposite. He finds there's one remaining uh, person in Saul's household. Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth, and he brings him in, and, and poor guy thinks that David's going to kill him, and he bows down, and his hands and knees, and all this stuff, and he David says, no, get up. Here's the deal. I love your father. Your father meant so much to me. I want to make things right. I want you to have back all the land that belonged to your family, which was a lot because Saul was the king. I mean, this would have been a massive amount of wealth. And he says, you're going to, from now on, you're going to eat at my table. He honors this son of Jonathan because he loved Jonathan that much. You know, when a person passes on, we oftentimes find ways to honor the things that they care about. We support the causes that they believed in. We, we take care of their children if they left children behind. We try to remember those values that they had. That's a great way to honor those who have gone on before us. Sometimes as families, we struggle with this. It's been said that where there's a will, there's a relative. And it's true, right? <laughs> We get in little fights about all, or big fights sometimes, over whether it's over stuff, which is kind of ironic, right? Because we'll fight over the stuff, but it'll be the same stuff that someday our kids will fight over, right? It, it's kind of dumb. But we get all wrapped up in this stuff. Or, or we, uh, we make mistakes and we don't treat each other with love and kindness. We treat each other in ways that if the, the deceased was still alive, they, they would be angry with us for the way that we're treating each other. We shouldn't do that. As followers of Jesus, our love should be our primary way of handling these things and walking these, these times out. Sometimes we also, in, in grief, we, we make the mistake of, uh, of using platitudes. You know what platitudes are? They're, they're statements that we make uh, that are, they, they sound good and they're trying to be encouraging, but they're really not helpful or true. Uh, let's say someone loses uh, a child. Right, a child passes away, and we say to him, well, I'm so sorry about your loss. God must have needed another angel up there in heaven, which is not true. The Bible never says that people become angels. No, God created angels. Angels and people were different categories here. Okay? We don't die and become angels. That's not true. Also, God is all powerful, right? Do you really think that God is up there in heaven saying, we are running way behind this month. We need to bring some of those humans up, make them into angels, and we'll get stuff done. We'll meet our quota, right? We'll, well our quarterlies will look better, right? Now, God isn't up there uh, held back because there's not enough of us around. God is not up there bored saying, I need some entertainment. Let's bring some new humans in, right? Don't you remember, God is everywhere. God is here. God doesn't need us to depart from here to know God, okay? We say these things because we're trying to make ourselves feel better. Because as people, we tend to be really bad at saying nothing, which is oftentimes the most helpful thing. I mean, think about it. When, when you have experienced loss, are you looking for somebody to come in with a bunch of not true statements to try to make you feel better? I'm not. When you've gone through loss, what has helped you the most? Anybody want to throw something out? What's helped you? Sorry? Love. Love, yes. Having someone show you love. How have they done that? Anybody show you love in a good way when you've experienced loss? They brought you food. That's a great one. I love that one. Others? Hugs. Absolutely. Hugs are a great way to help us through loss. Others? Tears. Sorry? Tears, yes, they cry with us. Having a friend to hug you, to cry with you, to love on you, to bring you food, these are great things. You don't owe them an explanation. You didn't cause the loss. 
It's okay. We don't have to be able to solve every problem. Love is really what solves the problem, if you will. And that can be one of the greatest ways we can help one another through these times of loss. Let yourself breathe. Leave these platitudes behind. We don't need those. Back in the 1960s, Elizabeth Hoover Ross wrote about these stages of grief. I think they're really helpful in, in dealing with loss. Uh, she wrote about five stages. People have worked on this and have been reworked in different ways, but uh, they help us to kind of understand a little bit of a roadmap of what grief and loss can look like. Uh, we've got a little cartoon strip that helps illustrate this. In this situation, the, the, the loss is pretty minor. It's a, a dad who has a, a young teenage daughter who wants him to take her to a particular concert that he doesn't want to go, with, go to. Now, I find this interesting because this will be me in a few years, so I probably start my grieving process already through this. But in his, his, you know, the first step in this process of grieving, these stages of grieving, grieving is denial. For our dad here, he says, I am never going to a Taylor Swift concert. I'm a self-respecting male. I don't need to show up at that stupid concert, right? Denial. It's probably going to happen, isn't it? Somehow he's going to get broken down throughout this whole sequence, and so he's in denial. The second stage is anger. He says, he says, why can't her mother take her to the concert, right? There's got to be some other solution. I shouldn't be the solution here. Somebody else needs to do something. This whole thing is taking me off. Third thing, go into depression. Say, I could be watching the Buckeyes win another championship right now. And yet I have to go to this concert, really? There's got to be many better ways I could be spending my time. Excuse me, that's, that's uh, depression. Uh, so so that, that we get depressed about that. Then kind of the next thing we go into is bargaining, right? We say, fine, I'll go, but I'm having a beer, right? I'm, that's what it takes, I'm going to do it. We, we, we bargain with God a lot, so we, we say these prayers. We say, God, if you will, if you will fix this thing, whatever this, this problem, this loss that I'm going through, if you, you'll take this away and you'll fix it. I'll do whatever, right? I'll, I will be on such good behavior, God. I, I'll stop cussing. I'll stop eating Twinkies so much late at night before bed. I'll go to church more often. Uh, I'll stop looking at all the girls in the yoga pants. I'll, whatever it takes. Hypothetical, right? I'll do whatever it takes, God, if you'll give me this thing that I'm asking for. We, we bargain. And in the final stage, which where we're going for is acceptance. And here he's singing along, right? He's fully engaged in the Taylor Swift experience. <laughs> Grief can look a little bit like that. So what if we take these stages kind of one by one? Denial. We, we tend to think of this as a bad thing, because, you know, denial is one thing that's about it. But this can actually be a short-term good thing. Here's how it works. When we go through a big loss, I mean a big loss, we get emotions that are big and overwhelming, more than we can process all at once. It's kind of like here in Inglewood, we've got some, we've got this great dam, right? That Route 40 goes over, and they built that dam because they got flooded really bad way back when, probably multiple times. And so we have this dam because sometimes we get so much rain, the river can't carry it out fast enough, so it builds up, so it floods. So we build dams so that we can hold that water back and let it through more slowly. This is what our bodies do. This is what denial is. It's like this emotional dam saying, whoa, the, the emotions are too big here. I can't deal with all this today. I was not equipped for this loss this day. And so we go into a bit of denial. Sometimes we even say, I can't believe this is happening. I don't even believe this is going on. I can't. I can't. And our friends look at us like we're crazy, saying, well, they're dead, right? You know this, you, you're crazy. But there's this denial that for a short term, it can be okay. Key words there are short term. Uh, it can also include shock. We can just be kind of immobilized. Just, I can't do anything. I, I don't know what to do with myself. When our friends go through this, we love them. It's the best thing to do. Second is anger. We get angry with maybe the person who caused the loss or with others who we are going to try to pin the loss onto because we're angry, we need to direct it at somebody. 
where we direct our, our anger towards God. And, and you know, I think God is big enough to handle our anger. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, it says to be angry, but, but do not sin. Don't let the sun, the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, you got to be careful about taking this too literally, right? Because if you really take it off right before dark, you know, it's, you probably can extend that out a little. What the Bible is saying is, don't hold on to that anger. Don't let days and weeks and months go by without dealing with this well. And when you're angry, don't sin. Don't say things you shouldn't. Don't hurt others. Anger in and of itself is a good thing. It's a god giving emotion. But it can be used in, in very bad ways at times. It's okay to be angry with God. God's big enough to handle your anger. If you ever read the Psalms, David gets mad at God numerous times. Tells God exactly how he feels. Yet he remains, he remains loving and respectful, but he's also extremely direct. And I've done the same thing, and God hasn't struck me down yet. I think God's big enough to handle our anger. I really think so, because that's how we work through it. We talk to him about it. He meets us in that place. That third state of depression. This is one we've got to be extremely careful with, because it's easy to get stuck here. And it can be a very dangerous place. We can, we can harm others. We can harm ourselves. We can become so immobilized, we can't get out of bed. Can't go to work. Can't do those things that, that are important. If you're sensing this, well, we really shouldn't reach out to others already, but if you're there, it now is kind of like crisis point to reach out to others. Don't do this alone. God didn't make us to go through loss alone. Jesus didn't. We shouldn't either. We, we need others to support us. Especially if you find yourself struggling to make it through those daily routines over a period of time, over a period of, of days, weeks. We need to seek help. Professional counselors are great for this. We oftentimes need their help. I mean, if you broke your arm, would you just lay in bed and hope it got better? No. Go get it set. Get a cast on that thing. Well, depression can be uh, an illness as well. And we need to take it seriously. And God can work through those things. Fourth, bargaining. Now, bargaining may sound kind of silly, uh, but bargaining is it's really it's just a way of trying to make sense of the loss and how we're going to go forward. It's a healthy step. And it's something sometimes that we need to do. And finally, acceptance. Acceptance does not mean that I said, well, I'm over it. I'm not sad anymore. It's like I never lost that person or never lost that. We don't get over things in that way. Big losses, they don't just like go away for us. Um, in fact, I know for, I have friends who they've lost parents. They say, you know what, I miss dad or I miss mom every day. And that's okay. It, it's mom and dad. They, they mean a lot. They impact our lives. What acceptance means is that I can move forward. I can move forward in those things that God's calling me to do. I don't need to be immobilized by this grief. While I may have some, this sadness or some grieving yet to do, I can be moving forward, accepting that my life is going to be okay by the grace of God through this. Now, these, these stages of grief, they, they, they can make it sound almost a little too simple. And, and Cooper Ross is very direct about this and saying that not everybody goes through all these, and we don't always do them in a linear fashion. You know, we, we experience grief, and we want it to kind of look like this, right? Like, events, and I go through these stages, and now I better move on. But in reality, grief looks a little more like this. It's all messed up. And you may go into one stage, and out into another one, and back into the one you were just at. It, it may take time. It will take work. This is not easy stuff. But friends, know that you don't do it alone. And as followers of Jesus, we go through grief with a completely different hope than the rest of the world does. Because we understand that we have something with us, something inside of us, 24-7, that makes our experience different. We have the love of God living in us through the Holy Spirit. When we become a follower of Jesus, that Spirit is always with us, always strengthening us, helping us through even the darkest of times, especially the darkest of times. Book of Romans chapter 8 says this, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Death can't, 
Life can't, angels can't, demons can't, our Christian today, our worries about tomorrow, even the powers of hell can't separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing. No loss that you have experienced, are experiencing, or will experience from this day forward can separate you from that love of God. We take hope in this because we know that whatever loss we're experiencing, in one form or another, it's temporary. Because this life here is not forever. This is not what eternity it is like. Revelation 21, 4. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This stuff is temporary, friends. The Bible gives us so much hope. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you're feeling overwhelmed and crushed by grief, God is here to save you. You're not alone. You don't walk this thing alone. John 16, 22, Jesus said, So you also have sorrow now, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace, Jesus' peace, he gives to us. Not as the world gives, does he give to us. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Psalm 147, 3, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Friends, this is God's work. And this is how God meets us in our times of loss. Jesus, would you heal our broken hearts? There's not a person in this room who hasn't experienced loss. Some of us are in the throes of it right now. God, we need you. Others of us, it may have been a while, but boy, it sure is hard. And as we talk today, there's emotions that come back up, the pain that's well back up inside of us. Jesus, would you help us? Would you walk with us? Can, would you help us to cast all of our cares on you? Because we know that you care about us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take an eternal perspective on loss. That as we grieve, we do so very seriously because we know we need to be whole and healthy here in this life. But we also know that this life is not the final score, but instead that we get to spend eternity with you where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more loss, and no more tears. Jesus, would you meet us in our times of grief? Would you use us to be instruments of your love and your grace for others who are going through loss? Help us to have that shoulder they can cry on, to give the hug that comforts, to say the kind words that encourage, to give the support that is needed. God, thank you that you walk with us each step of the way. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.